Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Nyren. I'm the head of digital marketing and analytics at the MIT Press. And um, today we have a very special guest, Caitlin Ring Carlson, who will be speaking with us about hate speech. Hi, Caitlin. How are you doing? Good morning, Hannah. I'm great. I'm really happy to be here with everybody. So to start off, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, Caitlin? Sure thing. So I am an associate professor here at Seattle University. I teach uh, media law and media systems primarily. And my research is focused on media law policy and ethics from a feminist perspective. And so essentially, I really look at issues that are at the intersection of freedom of expression and social justice. And for the last decade or so, the real focus of that has been on hate speech, particularly hate speech on social media. So thinking and talking a lot about kind of what is it? What do we do about it? You know, how has the changing technological and information environment really exacerbated this, this problem. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to chatting with folks about this today and hopefully giving them the information that they need to form their own opinion on what I would argue is a pretty complicated and nuanced issue. There are no, unfortunately, no easy answers here. Awesome. So I know that you have a presentation to share with us today. Um, I do. I'm pretty excited for that. Sh should I go ahead and share my screen? Yeah, yeah. And I just wanted to note that this book is one of the latest additions to our essential knowledge series. And um, Caitlin is a big user of our essential knowledge series. So I'm glad that you're here to be our spokesperson. I am, I tell you, I used the memes book in class for years before MIT approached me about doing this. So it's just, it's very serendipitous. Um, well, like I said, welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here and talking with you about um, this new book, Hate Speech. Uh, it really is, I think if I were to describe the book, it's really, if you sat down next to me at a bar or a coffee shop and said, you know, what is the deal? Um, this is kind of what I would tell you. So I've tried to organize this talk kind of around the pressing questions that come up around what hate speech is and what do we do about it? And as I said earlier, there really are no easy answers. I think um, countries, cultures, corporations, individuals are all kind of wrestling with how do we promote free expression while protecting human dignity and finding that that balance is challenging. And so again, my goal here today is really to give you the information that you need to really form your own opinion about this, this complicated and nuanced issue. So unfortunately, no culture or country is immune to hate speech. I'll show you a couple examples here. Uh, this is a post that appeared a few years ago on Facebook in Myanmar. There has been a concerted campaign by, actually by uh, the military in Myanmar against the Rohingya. It's led to the exodus of over 700,000 people from that country, excuse me. Um, and really, they were targeted with all kinds of uh, hate speech on social media. You can see an example here, may it, what the text that you're looking at reads. It says, may the terrorist, terrorist dog Kalars fall fast and die horrible deaths. So oftentimes, you'll see hate speech is um, comparing people to animals, which we know is, is problematic in that it dehumanizes them. Um, this is a photo of the Zeduku Kai hate group in Japan. Um, this is a group that really targets ethnic Koreans in the country and a lot of their activities I think mirror what we think about as hate group activity here in the United States. This is a rather new phenomenon and we'll talk about it here in a bit that Japan has actually created a, a law recently to try and combat this. In South Africa, uh, members of the LGBTQ community are regularly um, the victims of hate speech. This example I'm showing you is from John Kwame who's a journalist and he was also the ambassador to Uganda. He actually was convicted for hate speech in 2008 and required to apologize. And then unfortunately there are images like this one from our own country, which I think we are all too familiar with. This is from right before the Unite the Right rally uh, back in 2017 in Charlottesville. Uh, this was the incident where uh, hate groups marched uh, saying things like Jews will not replace us um, and they were protesting the potential removal of a Confederate statue. So we know that issues or discussions of hate speech come up as we are talking about kind of ancillary issues, whether it's this uh, removal of Confederate statues or the debate that's going on right now about whether and how we teach critical race theory. Um, and so it's really, I think, important for all of us to understand what hate speech is and what it isn't. So 
hate speech, uh, and this, this definition I think reflects a lot of what, for example, the European Union or other groups will, will use as a, a working definition. And it says that expression, hate speech is expression that seeks to malign people for their immutable characteristics. You can see the list here, but essentially what this is talking about are things about ourselves that we cannot change. So our race, our ethnicity, our gender identity, our sexual orientation, right? Things that are fixed. What hate speech isn't is simply offensive language saying, hey, you know, I don't like you because you voted for this person or I think you're a jerk for these reasons, right? It's not about the things we do, it's about who we are. Um, I think it's also really important to differentiate hate speech from hate crimes. So in many countries, including the United States, we have um, elevated penalties for uh, crimes committed that target people specifically because of those fixed or immutable characteristics. So for example, um, if somebody commits an assault against a trans woman and they targeted that woman because she's trans, uh, they're susceptible, at least in the United States, to additional penalties that may look like additional jail time or uh, additional fines. Now, in addition to this kind of surface level definition, I think it's really important that we recognize that hate speech is a structural phenomenon. Essentially what I'm arguing and what I mean here is that hate speech is something that is used by people in power to maintain their preferred position in the social hierarchy. Um, and we'll see examples of this kind of throughout history. So for example, if we think about the Holocaust, right? Um, there was a concern that Jewish folks were, um, you know, uh, gaining economic power. And so one of the things that was used was language to really dehumanize this group. So before the Holocaust, Jewish people were referred to as all kinds of things, including uh, rats. And we see this, this, I mentioned earlier, this comparison to animals. It happened again. Uh, the Hutu in the 1990s in Rwanda referred to Tutsis as cockroaches, right? And we saw the example from Myanmar where they're talking about dogs. This, this dehumanization, this othering is part of what makes violence against these groups more palatable, right? So it really is a tool um, that is used by people in power to kind of maintain their powerful position and put others down. And really by othering people, by, by putting them down, we create conditions for discrimination, bias motivated violence. What you're looking at here, I, I absolutely love this graphic. This is from the Anti-Defamation League. And it really shows how I think sometimes folks will say, well, hate speech is a a symptom of racism, or it's a symptom of misogyny or homophobia. And I think, I'm not sure that's entirely accurate. I think it's part and parcel of these problems. And this, this graphic, I think, really speaks to that. So uh, you can see how things like, um, and, and hate speech is probably on the green level, right? So the use of name calling, slurs, epithets, dehumanization, um, all of that stuff is really the foundation or the building blocks on which discrimination or bias motivated violence or genocide is built, right? Uh, if you go to the Holocaust Museum in DC, um, you'll see the plaque there that says it started with words. And I think that really um, captures the sentiment of like, well, why does this matter? It's sticks and stones will, will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Couldn't be further from the truth, right? We see how words and language play a role in kind of creating our social reality and um, again, fostering the conditions for bias motivated violence. Now, in terms of why we do it, um, I guess the best answer I've come across is it's complicated. Uh, social identity theory is a um, theory posited by a, a, a academic named Henry Tajfel. And essentially what he's arguing is that, you know, we're social creatures. And so um, we want to have kind of positive reinforcement for our membership in our own group. And so one of the ways we do that is by degrading others, uh, again, in other groups, right? And, and I think there are some really kind of safety, psychological uh, needs that are filled when we feel threatened that one of the ways that we do that is by lashing out at members of other groups. Now, in the United States, hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. The US is absolutely the exception to the rule when we think about most other democracies. Now, as we'll talk about, just because a, a country has laws on the books doesn't mean that it's effective. 
uh, at regulating hate speech. And sometimes we see that these laws can be used against the people they were designed to protect, which is obviously problematic. Um, but in the United States, we take a much different approach, okay? Um, unless speech falls into one of the categories carved out by the Supreme Court as an exception to the rule, if you will. Um, so for example, fighting words, true threats, incitement to violence, right? These are not protected categories of speech, but realistically, most hate speech does not fall into those categories. Most hate speech in the United States is protected by the First Amendment. And so this kind of raises the question, well, why do we do that, right? What are the justifications or the theories that scholars will offer up in terms of well, why protect all expression? Um, and so I wanna kind of explain some of these to you um, and talk about some of the criticisms against them. Um, some of these ideas, like the first one here, the marketplace of ideas it, are, are <laughs> hundreds of years old, right? And so marketplace of ideas really starts with John Milton in the 1600s, John Locke talks about this. Uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in, incorporates it into First Amendment jurisprudence in this country um, in Abrams case in 1920. And so you can see it's got this long history. And essentially what this theory says is that in order for truth to emerge, right, we need to have all information kind of competing with one another in the public sphere, right, that it could kind of could, should battle it out. And then from that battle or that process, the truth will rise to the top. And I think in theory, this is a great idea. I think it's important when we talk about the marketplace to really recognize how the information ha environment has changed. There's another EKS book called Post Truth. And I think thinking about this, is this a post-truth era, right? We know that there are examples like climate change or like some of the recent debates about COVID and, and what um, remedies exist and the danger or not danger of vaccinations, right? We can see that there are these issues where the public debates and there's so much information available that it's really hard to determine what's a credible source and what's accurate. And so people have really misconceptions about things like, like climate change. Um, and so I think the marketplace of ideas, again, good in theory, but how does it work uh, today? I think it's also really important to think about who has access to the marketplace. So I would argue that money makes a big difference about who has access in terms of um, being able to get their message across. So too does race or gender. Um, and so we wanna think about you know, whether we all have access to the marketplace, is this a reasonable justification for protecting all expression, including hate speech? Um, other folks will reference this idea of democratic self-governance. This comes from a scholar called Alexander Michael John back in 1948. And essentially the argument goes that in order for us to govern ourselves effectively, we need access to all information. And that includes hate speech, that includes uh, mis and disinformation, right? In order for us to, again, effectively make decisions about which candidates or policies to support, we need that information. Now. There are folks, including Danielle Citron, for example, who pushed back on this and basically said, especially given the amount of our civic life that we live out online, um, when there is this cacophony of noise that includes hate speech or mis and disinformation, it's really hard to, for especially for some people to participate, right? So if, you know, there are all kinds of, of, of slurs being directed, for example, at women on a, a debate forum online or on Facebook even, you know, are folks as willing or as able to participate in that debate so that they can, again, and participate in the process of self-governance. So something to kind of think about. The next justification for why we protect all expression, including hate speech, is personal liberty. And essentially, uh, this idea comes from Thomas Emerson. And what he said was, you know, in order for me to achieve my full human self, right, to, to self-actualize, to be the, the person that I'm supposed to be, I can't have the government telling what me what to say or when to say it. Um, I think you know, a valid argument, one of the things to think about is, well, how do we balance personal liberty with human dignity, right? What happens when your liberty impacts my dignity? I think it's also important to recognize here that, especially in the United States, there are lots of restrictions on free expression. I think it's very popular rhetorically to say, you know, no law means no law, First Amendment, right? All, all speech is protected. That's simply not the case. Right, we have tons of regulations that limit, for example, commercial speech. I can't lie and say, oh gosh, you know, drink a Diet Coke and you'll lose 20 pounds this week. 
And so again, I think there's a lot of uh, misconceptions uh, about kind of how free speech actually works in the United States. Um, specifically talking about hate speech, people will reference the bellwether argument. And this basically says that in order for us to know how homophobic or racist we are, we need have access to all that information. You'll also hear people talk about the safety valve, which essentially says, you know, in order to blow, it's better for us to be able to blow off steam through language, right, um, rather than, than violent action. Again, because we see this relationship between language and bias motivated violence, I think there's not a lot of empirical evidence for that argument. The last piece I'll mention, and this is one that really does, at least for me, this gets stuck in my craw. This one I, I buy. Um, I don't trust the government to regulate hate speech, right? We can see how, uh, given the nuance that is uh, exists when we come to define hate speech, I can see a situation where, let's say, the government um, says, you know, I don't like what you said about the president. That's hate speech. You're you're going to be fined or you're going to jail, right? Um, wh who do we let define hate speech and enforce that? And we've seen historically that those laws can be misused. And so I think that's a really reasonable um, concern uh, when it comes to regulating hate speech. Now, all of that said, uh, most other countries, including the, the EU, as well as the, the countries that you can see represented here, do regulate hate speech. So I'll just talk a little bit um, about kind of how they go about this. And I wanna make sure I leave plenty of time uh, for questions. So I won't go too far into the details, but I do think it's important for people to recognize that, for example, the UN has prohibitions that uh, require member states to uh, enact laws uh, against, um, for example, uh, propaganda or organizations that are based in ideas of racial or ethnic superiority, um, while still recognizing the importance of freedom of thought, freedom of religion, et cetera. Um, all of these rules came to be after World War II. So after World War II, the UN is formed. Uh, they initiate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The very first human right is the right to human dignity. And then years later, within kind of the 1940s, they also um, enacted the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which basically says that advocacy of national, racial, religious hatred um, that constitutes incitement to discrimination is prohibited, right? So I think they're taking the lessons learned from the Holocaust and really trying to prevent something similar from happening in the future. The EU has a very specific law uh, prohibiting the use of hate speech, both in person and online. Uh, Germany, I think, is a really interesting case because of the Holocaust. Uh, I would argue that Germany has perhaps the most restrictive rules regarding hate speech. So. The German criminal code uh, provides penalties, which includes fines and jail time for incitement to hatred, attacks on dignity, distribution of hate propaganda, and Holocaust denial. Um, they also criminalized uh, group defamation, which here in the United States, we have individual libel, uh, but we don't recognize uh, libel towards large groups of, of people, and in Germany, they do. What's also really interesting, I think, about Germany is their most recent rule called Nets DG. And so essentially, they really have, have broken apart from what almost all other countries, what the UN recommends, all of that, to really hold social media companies accountable for illegal hate speech on their platforms. So the new Nets DG law requires social media companies to remove hate speech within 24 hours or face um, substantial fines. Uh, they're also requiring social media companies to produce a transparency report that documents kind of what information and accounts were removed when and why. Uh, our neighbors to the north in Canada also have very strict hate speech rules. Uh, their criminal code pro prohibits statements in public that promote hatred against an identifiable group. Uh, they prohibit advocacy to genocide. Uh, they also have a uh, applicable human rights code. What's interesting about Canada, I think, is they do have exceptions for religious speech. So there have been some interesting uh, cases and incidents where, for example, someone um, took out an advertisement in a Saskatchewan newspaper that basically showed two men holding hands and it had like that circle, that no smoking kind of line through it. Um, and this was considered to be uh, acceptable, not a violation of any of those rules uh, because it's protected religious speech. And so that, that tension between free expression and um, religious expression, I think is very real. 
uh, when people feel justified kind of maligning a group because of, for example, their sexual orientation, because that's what their religious religion tells them, should that expression be protected, um, that, that gets to be problematic. Uh, Brazil, I think, is an interesting example simply because they do have laws on the books, um, but they still have pretty rampant hate speech in the country. Um, Brazil has civil and criminal penalties, um, but we know that even their president, Bolsonaro, is, is regularly on record <laughs> talking about horrible, horrible things. So he said, for example, that gay children should be whipped or that Haitian immigrants are scum, right? And there are obviously no penalties. Here in the United States, we know that even our former president uh, said things like, you know, uh, all Mexicans are rapists and, and faced, obviously, because hate speech is protected in the United States, no penalties. Um, in South Africa, South Africa is worth mentioning because South Africa has um, the Equality Act, which prohibits publication of words um, involving protected classes or, pro pro excuse me, perpetuating systemic disadvantage. Um, but what's interesting is it's actually been used, these rules have been used by whites against black folks. And so, for example, in 2010, Julius Malima, who is the leader of the African National Congress uh, Youth League, was actually found guilty of violating the Equality Act for singing lyrics that degenerated Afrikaners, which were the whites who ruled during apartheid. And so um, there's also a really interesting example back in the 90s here in the United States, um, colleges tried to extend the fighting words doctrine uh, so that they would be allowed to have hate speech codes on campuses. Uh, these were eventually struck down by the Supreme Court as being um, content-based and, and as uh, exercising viewpoint discrimination. Uh, generally in First Amendment jurisprudence, it's, it's kind of um, almost impossible for the government to say, we agree with this side, but we don't agree with that side, right? They generally, unless something can pass strict scrutiny, um, it, we generally see more content neutral kind of regulations. And this was, was very much content based and was eventually thrown out. But what's really interesting, so like at the University of Michigan, I think it was, they had this hate speech code on, on the books for a year. And what ended up happening, there were 17 cases that year and 16 of those were brought by white students against black students, right? So we can see how even when we have these rules, the systemic inequalities that exist still oftentimes mean that they are misused or abused. And really that gets into kind of the various ways that laws, right, or, or other structures are used to uphold white supremacy. And that's what we see here. And I think that's what we saw in uh, South Africa. They've got a and combating of hate crimes and hate speech. This bill um, was recently approved, but again, I don't know how much difference it's gonna make. Japan, as I mentioned earlier, um, is, is an interesting example because um, they've had this recent hate group activity. The Zedo Kukai are, are very vocal and very present. Um, the way that the law, they have a national law now, but what's interesting in Japan, a lot of times laws aren't necessarily negative. They're not saying you can't do this. They're saying you should do this, right? And that's what the national law essentially says. Now, some of the states have uh, pushed back on this. And so, for example, Kawasaki just uh, passed a new law with a little bit more teeth saying, no, there's going to be punishments. Japan is really interesting. They will um, look at incidents of hate speech and do kind of like almost like a... Um, public acknowledgement or shaming or, or naming of the people who've been engaged. So really a different way and, and a, I guess culturally specific way to go about dealing with this issue. Now, what are the justifications for regulating hate speech? We talked earlier about kind of why we protect all expression in the United States, um, including hate speech. Now, when we look at these other countries and the, and the reasons for them doing it differently. So we talked earlier about this idea of human dignity. So hate speech violates people's human dignity and therefore should not be um, permissible, right? We also know that hate speech causes um, psychological and emotional harm, both to children and adults. So really interesting, a Journal of American Medical Association journal called Pediatrics um, had a study a few years ago that found that public expressions of discrimination generate stress and behavioral health problems, particularly in children who are part of a racial or ethnic minority. Uh, we also know that this causes physiological harm. So, so real uh, experience and, and lived, I guess, trauma 
Um, in 2019, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a report that was based on 180 other studies that essentially warned of the acute health dangers, right? Physical impacts of racism in the, in the public sphere in young people, right? We know that this causes harm to folks both psychologically, emotionally, as well as physiologically. We also have to recognize, and this goes back to the, the pyramid that we had looked at initially, that allowing hate speech creates a climate for dis discrimination, right? If this is okay, then that is okay. So if it's okay to refer to a member of the LGBTQ community um, with a slur, then perhaps it's okay to, you know, not hire them because they're a member of the LGBTQ community or, you know, not offer a, a housing loan to a same-sex couple, right? So it creates this climate for, for discrimination. And also in thinking about free expression, there's a, a really, uh, I think, interesting argument about the silencing effect that um, hate speech can have. It prohibits certain people from participating in public debate. Now, we couldn't talk about hate speech without talking about hate speech on social media. So social media since 2006 or so have really created um, a new place or platform for social media to, or excuse me, for hate speech to proliferate. Um, social media organizations are not bound by the First Amendment. They essentially are free, even if they're based in the United States, they're free to prohibit far more speech than the government. Um, and so many of them do prohibit hate speech, but that hasn't necessarily kept hate speech off those platforms. There are also platforms like Gab or Parler or 8chan or 4chan that absolutely say, you know, this is a place for free speech, let it all hang out, right? And we know that those places have become hotbeds for extremism, right? Places where people are um, essentially uh, radicalized. Um, and so it's important to understand, you'll hear people talk a lot about Section 230 in the United States. Essentially what this law says is that social media companies aren't liable for illegal content on their site. So for what we as third parties do. So for example, if I posted something libelous about Hannah who introduced us earlier um, and she wanted to sue me, she'd be well within her rights, but she couldn't necessarily sue Twitter where I had posted the information. They are immune from that liability. Um, it's interesting because in the United States, hate speech is protected. So a change in Section 230 might really move the needle around issues like online harassment or even copyright violations, but it's probably not going to have an impact on hate speech. Again, social media companies are free to regulate hate speech really almost however, however they like. Um, it's also important to recognize that we agree to those rules, right? So um, when we click I agree in order to access a particular platform, essentially what we're doing is entering into a contract with a company that says, you know, I'm going to play by your rules um, in order to access Twitter or Snapchat or Instagram or whatever platform we're, we're getting on. Now, the process of content moderation, again, mostly up to social media companies, right, with a few exceptions. Um, essentially has three parts. And this comes from um, this kind of way of thinking about content moderation and comes from a book called Custodians of the Internet from Tarleton Gillespie. And it really includes three different things. So the policies, right? Social media organizations have a lot of power to say what is or isn't allowed on their site. So if they wanted to, Twitter tomorrow could say, we are not going to allow any comparisons of people to animals on our site, site hard stop, right? They choose not to do that. And really that, that choice shows up as well in the AI, right? So uh, removal of hate speech is basically happening two different ways, right? There are sophisticated algorithms that are uh, scanning content, identifying what the algorithm believes is hate speech and either flagging it or removing it. Right. We also have on many platforms community flagging where I as a user can look at something and say, mm, that seems problematic. I'm going to flag it um, and either the AI or human content moderator is going to review it in both of these places. Right. Especially when we're thinking about the AI, the AI is very sophisticated. It can do a lot of different things. Right. So there's these really um, interesting programs that do things like engrams or bag of work. Right. There's these computer science techniques that allow for natural language processing and removal of, of hate speech. 
but it does require software engineers or uh, even policymakers at the company to choose to do certain things. And I think where there's issues potentially are, are they choosing to remove enough of this, right? So the cynic in me is very quick to say that on a lot of these platforms, having hate speech keeps people engaged. It keeps them on the platform spending time, which allows them to sell um, that attention to advertisers. And so it's not necessarily in the financial best interest of these companies to remove hate speech. Okay. And so when we see, you know, a, a plethora of hate speech on Twitter, that's not a result of, oh, the tech can't remove it. It could, it's a choice not to. So what do we do? Right. When it comes to hate speech online, I think there are um, some really interesting potential solutions. We've seen, um, obviously, former President Trump is probably the most well-known case of this, but even folks like Milo Yiannopoulos or Jordan Peterson, um, far-right uh, extremists, deplatforming works, right? Uh, we also see quite a bit of shadow banning. Uh, essentially, this is where the person's not necessarily, uh, their account's not removed, but the companies are limiting the reach of that content. So it's not reaching the audience that the person intends. Um, I think another important place where we could think and talk about potential changes is in terms of anonymity, right? I think um, there's a lot of research that shows that we engage in this process of disassociation when we're online, right? That's not the real me um, because it says, you know, Carl so 42 instead of my real name. Um, and so that might be a place where we could make some changes. I also think, and this is, I think something um, that's really important is the policies themselves. So whether that is how we are training and implementing the AI, um, what are the actual community standards? What do we allow, not allow, right? Twitter makes a choice. Slurs are, are permitted, racial slurs are permitted on Twitter, hard stop, right? So, so that's an easy fix. If they wanted to change that, they could. Um, I think there's a call among scholars and activists for increased transparency. So the Santa Clara principles uh, were created in 2018. They're actually in the process of being revised now. Um, and this is a set of best practices or guidelines for social media companies, particularly those based in the United States to follow. And it calls for things like uh, transparency reports, right? Um, I also think there's been some positive outcomes from partnerships between governments and social media organizations. Uh, I know in Europe, there are uh, efforts between certain countries to work with social media platforms and those efforts have borne fruit, right? That they're able to review and remove a substantial amount of illegal hate speech. Again, in the United States, I think revising section 230 is a potential option. I don't think it's gonna, I think again, it would deal really well with things like online harassment or hate speech that crosses a line into incitement to violence or true threats. But most hate speech is not gonna reach that level and is gonna continue to be protected by the first amendment. And so there's no liability for social media companies who do or don't remove that. I think more broadly, and this is kind of where I close in the book, you know, I am somebody that I do, I, I recognize concerns about governments restricting any kind of expression and I share those concerns, right? I don't necessarily trust the government to make good clear choices in this in this area. And so um, I think there's a real threat for political dissent to be stifled and that that's problematic. Where I do think we've got a lot of wiggle room are in terms of civil penalties. So remember criminal law is when the government's bringing charges, civil law is when um, one person is suing another. And I think there are existing torts on the books like intentional infliction of emotional distress uh, that could be used uh, to potentially um, offer a remedy to victims of hate speech. Now, the Supreme Court does not agree with me here. Uh, in Snyder v. Phelps, the Westboro Baptist case, they said, no, uh, we're not going to recognize, uh, you know, harmful speech that occurs on public issues in public places as, as being um, justification or cause for someone's emotional distress. We're not going to kind of punish that speech. Um, I also think we've got a real opportunity to change the way that we um, use defamation laws. And so if we were to open those up a bit and uh, recognize group defamation, so when someone says something about all people, uh, right? Like, so the example I gave earlier where former President Trump says, you know, Mexicans are rapists. If I'm Mexican and that harms my reputation, potentially I could sue. Now with civil law, it's really important to remember there's a ton of privilege 
uh, people have to have oftentimes the, the financial and other resources uh, to be able to do that. So it's not a perfect solution. Another place I would look is expanding human rights laws that exist around um, ensuring that discrimination doesn't happen because these things are kind of part and parcel that might be um, an opportunity. But I think we also all have a responsibility um, to really address hate speech in our own lives. So whether that's an off color joke, whether that's something that is shared on social media, you know, saying something right to, to intervene as a bystander and say, hey, that's not cool. <laughs> um, I, I think is is something that we can all do in this very moment to try to mim minimize the harm caused by by unchecked hate speech. So that's all I've got in terms of a presentation. I think we've got just about 20 minutes left or so. So I'd be really anxious and excited um, to hear questions from, from the audience. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, we already have one very long question. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that people are thinking very hard about this subject. So the question is, um, regarding the quote unquote group defamation distinction you mentioned, I think we need to clarify what we mean by defamation. Defamation law in America has a very high and what I consider perfectly reasonable threshold. <laughs> it's a long one. Okay. You need to make a specific, clear, false claim about what someone has said or done to transgress among other conditions. Characterization, insinuation, caricature, et cetera, are well in the clear. You can legally call a person, say Trump, easy, easy target, a pervert, a buffoon, a cockroach, a monkey, or a menace to society, a threat to civilization, et cetera. Why should the rules for groups be any different? I feel like so, I should write all, all those. No, no, no. I'm happy. I I live in the weeds, so let's get in there. So essentially in the United States, so libel is state law, right? And so states would have to wrestle with this kind of individually, but essentially it requires us to prove a couple different things, right? That the statement was published, that we can identify the person in the statement, um, that it defamed them, right? It injured their reputation. And oftentimes if we want the big money, right? Somebody's got to prove actual malice, which means that they knew the information was false or they showed reckless disregard for the truth, right? And I think for me, the place where I would perhaps intervene is in identification. So right now we basically say that, let's say somebody says something um, about professors at Seattle U in the communication department. There are about 12 of us. And so that's a small enough group where I could say, if I meet all those other conditions, right, I can bring a successful, successful libel case. When it comes to group defamation, what I'm saying, let's expand that number from less than 25 to infinite, right? And so it's it's really shifting. It's not necessarily changing the parameters of something like actual malice, but what it is doing is shifting how we think about identification within existing libel law to say that if I'm part of that group, it doesn't matter what size the group is, I can still meet that piece of the, the, the requirements to bring a libel suit. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we have another question. In usability testing, certain words used on record are and can be expunged. Does it foreclose? Oh, I'm not quite sure. Do you know what, what this is um, referencing? In usability testing, in quotes again, certain words used on record are or can be expunged, question mark. Does it foreclose any inferences about the team? I'm going to move on to the next one. I'm not sorry. Okay, I, th I think what they're asking about. So I know I saw that. Um, uh, I'm, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing the name right. Dr. Tadapali, um, I think, is a computer scientist. And so I think what he's asking about is um, kind of the, the different uh, algorithms associated with natural language processing. Uh, and basically saying if the, the program is designed to go in and remove a word, can it? Absolutely. Um, does it foreclose inferences about the team? I, I'm not sure what he's getting at. I'm wondering if he maybe is thinking or talking about some of the implicit bias that software engineers bring to the process. Um, there's a huge debate uh, about whether technology itself is neutral. 
that's not something I want to wade into necessarily, but I think it's really important. And I think what he's, he's referencing and recognizing is the fact that, um, we bring our implicit biases into everything we do. Uh, Harvard's got a great, if anybody hasn't taken it yet, I strongly recommend Harvard's implicit bias test. Bias test. It's online, you can just Google Harvard implicit bias test. And it shows that even those of us who think, you know, I'm all about, you know, social equality and equity and racial justice and gender justice and all of these things, uh, we, we have implicit biases. And I know that, you know, software engineers uh, bring that to the table, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, when they're putting these algorithms together. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think we have a few books on that as well. <laughs> All right, so what are some pressures the government and the general public put on social media sites to incentivize them to do better with hate speech? And I think do better is kind of a, a loaded phrase, I guess, to monitor hate speech more. No, I I thank you uh, for this question, because I think one, one thing we have to be clear is whether we're talking about the US or other countries, right? So I think in other countries, we're seeing, um, I think, really interesting partnerships and various forms of pressure, I'll say, put on by governments, right? I don't think the US puts a ton of, right, calling, uh, you know, Mark and Jack and whoever from Twitter and Facebook in to testify before Congress, I don't think is getting the job done, right? I think what they are very susceptible to in the US is public pressure, right? So anytime there's there's bad PR associated with the volume of hate speech on these platforms, we oftentimes will see them move to change, which again goes back, you know, the cynic in me has to feel like, why didn't you do that in the first place, right? These are countries that are make, or excuse me, these are companies that are making billions with a B, billions of dollars a year. There is no shortage of resources to address these issues. And so when the problem persists, it's oftentimes, um, for me at least, raises questions about what their motivations are. One of the things we saw, um, which is a bit disheartening, honestly, I know MIT uh, press kind of uh, participated in this, was the, the Stop Hate campaign uh, targeting Facebook, basically saying, you know, for a month or however long, you know, certain groups aren't going to advertise on Facebook as a way to motivate them to do more to remove hate speech from, from the platform. And I will, I, you know, I wanna give a little credit where credit's due. I think Facebook has improved over the past three or four years, right? It's getting better, it's not great. Um, but what's really interesting is researchers went back and looked at, did this have an impact on Facebook's bottom line? No, right? Um, they make so much money and this was kind of uh, around the time of the 2020 presidential election. And so they were making so much money off of uh, political ads. And so it didn't really, negatively impact them financially, but I do think that those types of pressure, whether they're from the general public, whether they're from organizations, advertisers, uh, they help, uh, but I, I think more potentially is needed. One of the places that a lot of folks are looking is is antitrust, basically saying these companies for a million different reasons are, are far too big. Um, and so what we need is for the government to step in and break them up, which would hopefully uh, make it easier for them to address some of these issues or motivate them potentially to, to do so. Great, thank you for your answer. Um, I guess this is a little separate from the topic of conversation now, but I guess the real question is, um, how do we prevent monopolies from happening in those industries? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it's funny because we've talked a little bit about this, you know, this in, an industry of this size that is virtually unregulated is mind boggling, mind boggling, right? There's more regulation in the restaurant across the street from me, from the government, right? They're going to go in, they're going to do a health inspection, they're going to give them a grade, all this right? None of that is happening in tech. And so whether it's the, the path of, of antitrust, right? Breaking up monopolies, whether it's other forms of, of oversight, um, right? We have OSHA, right? You're not, gonna, you're not gonna do exactly what you want in a mine. Why would we let these companies kind of run rampant when we know, you know, we're talking here today about hate speech, which has detrimental impacts all over the globe. Um, there's also this issue of mis and disinformation, right? That we have misinformation rampantly, rampantly spreading on these platforms and there's no government oversight to prohibit it, 
um, or to punish it. And so I think there's a lot of different ways we could go about uh, intervening. I, I just think at this point, it's necessary to intervene. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question. What are your thoughts about hate speech laws being used in countries like Russia and Venezuela to silence and jail political opponents? What's the difference between those hate speech laws and the ones that you're advocating? So that's a great I'm not advocating any laws, but yeah. Um, well, actually, I mean, I am. So I think kind of what I, I ended the presentation with is really my point. So I don't necessarily advocate for government for criminal penalties, right? Uh, against hate speech. That That is exactly why, right? So the ability for government to silence political dissent makes me very nervous about having a law on the books the same way we have a law that says you can't speed or you can't break and enter into a property or something like that, right? What I do think we have an opportunity for is civil laws, right? So that's not the government bringing charges or, or having a suit, that's individuals. So that's me suing you for the harm you caused me as a victim of hate speech. And I think that's a really important distinction to make and I'm glad, glad they brought that up. Do you see any examples of hate speech coming from the other side of the political spectrum or is this a problem exclusive to more conservative viewpoints? So I would actually push back against this. I, I, I get what the person is asking. Um, I think that hate speech is not relegated to any particular political viewpoint. Now, there is research that has looked at um, not hate speech, but civility online. Um, and that's a really important distinction. And what that found was that you are likely to see less civility on conservative or right-leaning websites than on left-leaning. But I, I think it's pretty dangerous to try and peg this as a right-left issue. Um, <laughs> Right-wing, left-wing, they're both wings on the same bird. And I think that there are all kinds of different ways that people from both sides of the, of the political spectrum or all sides of the political spectrum engage in, in various forms of hate speech. I'm thinking, for example, about uh, there's a, a group of radical feminists who genuinely believe that trans women don't deserve the same rights as women, as, as naturally born women. And so um, that's a place where I can say to me, that is, that is problematic hate speech and needs to be addressed, right? There are even hate groups that kind of believe that. So again, I think we are more likely to see it on the right, but I think it's an issue that impacts across the political spectrum. Thank you. And you, you listed a lot of different countries and different roles. And I think, I think looking at the speech laws in other countries can be a little shocking to an American audience because we're so used to having free speech and we're so proud of it. And um, I, I feel like maybe it's kind of a, a luxury compared to some other places where again, you could be imprisoned for saying something against the ruler. Um, but what do you think we could learn from other countries? That's a great question. So I, I, I do want to, I guess, reiterate my appreciation for our ability to engage in expression, particularly political expression, right? That if I want to say, I think Joe Biden's an idiot, or I think tr Trump's an idiot, I'm free to do so. And, and that's the exact kind of language that in many countries would get political dissidents jailed, right? Um, so I think that when we think about free expression, that's, that's the stuff we most want to protect. I think one of the lessons that we could take from other countries, and honestly from our own country, I think there's a misunderstanding of how First Amendment jurisprudence works. So oftentimes a way to think about it is if political speech is what we want to protect the most, commercial speech is what we maybe care the least about protecting, right? We want as consumers to be able to get information about products. And so we have rules that say you can't lie, right? And so there's all these different things in between. And there are legal scholars, including uh, on the Supreme Court, who have talked a lot about this idea of high value speech and low value speech. And we're much more likely to regulate low value speech, okay? And so I think when we think about what are other countries getting right, I think having civil penalties like group defamation is something that I see as, as potentially something they're getting right. I think the partnerships with social media companies to um, work together to eradicate hate speech on the platforms are something that they're doing right. I think recognizing human dignity as a right 
is something that they do that we simply don't do. Now, a lot of this is because their constitutions were written after ours, right? So um, many countries rewrote their constitution after World War II. So for example, Germany, right, has a chance to reconsider what it wants to be the balance between protecting human dignity and the right to free expression. And a lot of those countries have chosen to put dignity above the right to free expression. And, and so I think if we were to at least recognize that as a, as a right that's worth protecting, um, it may shift the balance of the conversation so that we could address these issues, again, in thoughtful, nuanced ways. There's not going to be, I do not think that the solution is like, well, write a law and the problem solved. We've seen that in other countries right, that the laws can be misused and abused. So maybe the solution isn't necessarily even a legal one. Maybe it's really getting to some of the structural inequities. Why is it that uh, members of the Proud Boys feel like they need to reassert the dominance of the white race, right? W what makes that okay? And so again, part of that goes back into, you know, what are we teaching people? I think these debates around critical race theory in schools have been fascinating. Uh, critical race theory essentially is something that's mostly taught in law schools, right? Um, or even in upper level uh, undergraduate. It's, it's not something necessarily that's taught in um, in elementary, but I do, or, or middle school, but I do think that the, the issues this brings up really demonstrate the need for more education around issues like racial equity or gender justice or these type of things, right? Um, I think people are grossly misinformed about the history of this country. Um, and I think, I, I, again, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not the right person to say what it is we need to be teaching students, but you know, I think there is, um, a bent towards white supremacy in our public education system right now. And so thinking about how do we get people to change the way we see one another, that that's really got to be part of the solution. I think slapping a law on something, um, I think it's important to create pathways for victims to, you know, pursue legal remedies. But I do not think that's the only part of the solution that these issues go much, much deeper. And so that our solutions need to go much, much deeper into um, addressing these, these these issues around, uh, again, racial inequity, gender inequity, that sort of thing. Great, thank you. So we have about six more minutes. So I think I have time for a couple more questions. Um, I have one about section 230. So, um, you know, not everyone here might know what section 230 is, but it's been involved in a lot of news stories recently over the past year and, um, can you explain how much, how this relates to hate speech and why this has been such contentious legislation? So I guess, first off, what is section 230? And then, you know, how does it relate to hate speech? Yeah, absolutely. So section 230 is actually part of the Communications Decency Act, which was part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And so um, the Communications Decency Act was really about uh, prohibiting sexual content online. Um, it was actually struck down, the majority of the Communications Decency Act was struck down by uh, the Supreme Court in a case called Reno v. ACLU, but the part that it kept was Section 230. And essentially what 230 says is that um, computer services, so that includes ISPs, social media, are not liable for what third parties do on their sites. Um, without getting too far into the weeds, there were some cases that happened, some, some libel cases that happened in the early days of the internet. And one of the things that those cases kind of split on was, you know, does regulating content in some way, shape or form uh, absolve you of that, that liability, right? We don't want a law that's just going to allow social media companies to say, well, I'm not going to do anything. Otherwise, I lose my, my immunity from, from, from liability. And so, we also have a Good Samaritan clause in Section 230, which basically says just because you do some sort of content moderation, essentially, doesn't mean that you're going to lose um, your immunity. So in, in simplest terms, essentially what 230 means is that social media or ISPs, any kind of community computer services are not legally liable for what third parties do on their site. So if I post something that violates copyright onto YouTube, for example, 
you can't sue YouTube. You can only sue me. If I post something libelous about you, Hannah, on Twitter, you can't sue Twitter. You can only sue me, right? And so I think what a lot of the concerns, and I'll be honest, I think this doesn't necessarily impact hate speech in the US because what it's talking about is illegal content. So if hate speech is legal, it's not necessarily gonna, gonna impact hate, hate speech removal. I think the place it would really have an important impact is online harassment. So online harassment is illegal. And um, what happens a lot of times is that uh, there'll be this egregious harassment going on. People will contact the platforms to get them to intervene and the, they won't, or they won't do anything simply because they're not liable. It's not their problem, right? Um, and so I think amending Section 230 would create incentives or motivate uh, companies to act. So one example I'll give really quickly, there's a case called Herrick v. Grinder, um, And there's a great book by Carrie Goldberg, if people haven't checked it out, called Nobody's Victim. And, and she was the attorney. She's a victim's rights attorney. She was the attorney on this case. But essentially what happened is somebody used Grinder to um, antagonize and harass their ex, right? So this guy sent like a thousand people to his ex's home and workplace under the auspices of hooking up, right? The guy says, wait a second, this is terrible. Let me contact Grinder. He contacts Grinder 50 times. Grinder does nothing, right? They pursue the case and time and time again throughout the, the trial, as well as through the appeal, um, Grinder is protected by Section 230. It's not Grinder's responsibility, even though with this case, they brought it as like a, um, a product claim, basically saying, I'm using your product correctly and it's causing this harm. Um, aren't you required to intervene? So I think there are places, especially around online harassment, that shifting 230 um, could really make a difference. But again, unless we change our minds and make hate speech illegal, which I don't see in the near future here in the States, um, then I think uh, it's not going to probably make much difference whether we change 230, at least in this regard. Great, thank you. Um, so one more question. Oh, there's another one in the Q&A. Well, first I'm going to ask two more questions. Uh, what don't we understand about the phenomenon of hate speech and what should future research focus on? Yeah, great question. Um, so I don't think we understand enough about the actual harm it causes, right? So there's not a ton of empirical evidence. I cited those couple of studies in my talk. Um, we need more of that, right? We need to really understand, I think, more about how it affects people um, and how it affects society. I think we have historical examples that we can look at, but a lot of that is just um, anecdotal, if you will, that we need the empirical data to really demonstrate the harm I think caused. Um, I also think we need more information about why people do it. I think, as I mentioned earlier, um, I do not know that the legal solution can be the only solution. And so really understanding the psychology better um, in terms of, of the future of this work, I think uh, I'm excited about some of the technological advancements. I think really what's needed is, is the appetite for change among social media organizations. And so, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer of, especially when we're talking about 4chan or 8chan um, or these other places, I think this person is asking about um, kind of the Proud Boys or QAnon moving into private online spaces you know, we don't really have the power to regulate private online spaces, um, which actually I, I, I do want to push back against this because um, even Facebook is private, right? They can do kind of what they want. And so um, I think there maybe is an opportunity to uh, think about whether and how the government steps in for oversight among all these private platforms. So for example, I mentioned earlier transparency reports. I think that's a great idea, right? Um, I think this question of anonymity is a great idea, right? Are you, are you gonna, you know, if you wanted to, you could create a law tomorrow that says you have to use your, you know, driver's license to attach to a social media platform. Now, again, that makes me nervous about stifling political dissent. I don't know if that's the right answer, but there are lots of different places um, that we could be looking. And I think it's really important, and I, I hope to kind of close with this. Um, social media is not even 26 years or 20 years old, right? So we really look at like mm, 2005, 2006, 2006 is Facebook, right? So I don't think 
I think we have to recognize this as a, a learning curve um, we did not know what giving every single person in the world that has access to the internet a microphone would do. And we see some really cool, amazing, awesome things that come with this and, and some problems. And so I think giving ourselves the grace to address those problems and also to really be creative and look for solutions that maybe aren't obvious um, and haven't been done before. Um, and I think to do that, we do need experts, whether that's in government or in these organizations, um, really, I, I think these organizations could donate a lot more resources to this issue. And maybe that's in terms of kind of circling back around to your original question in terms of the future, what would I like to see? I think, you know, there, there's no shortage of, of resources at places like Facebook or Twitter. And so asking them to do more um, to address this issue, I think is, is reasonable. Um, and, and I don't think we necessarily have to let them self-regulate. I think there's a place potentially for the government to step in um, and require things, like I said, like transparency reports. So we have some oversight into what they're doing. Great, thank you. And that wouldn't be the government regulating free speech necessarily, it would be other types of regulations. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for talking with us today, Caitlin. I feel like I learned so much and I hope everyone else did too. Um, we'll be sharing the video on our blog next week. And um, if you have any other questions, you can tweet it out and maybe we'll have time to answer them. But I think you answered a lot of questions today. So we're probably covered for a while. <laughs> well, thank everyone for, for being here and for your thoughtful questions. I've, I've so enjoyed the opportunity to, to speak with you about this. And I, um, you know, I wish, I wish I had the answer, but I think it's gonna take all of us uh, kind of plugging away at this issue to, to really move the needle. And I'm excited to be part of that work. Thank you. And if you want to find the book Hate Speech, it's a nice pocket size, quick read. I'm excited to read it this week. Um, you can go to mitpress.mit.edu and you can find all our books there, but Hate Speech is also there. Great. Thanks so much, Hannah. Take care. Thank you. Bye.